Puff. Could you introduce the basic idea of negative theology according to the Rambam versus the popular opinion? And um, which is reading the Torah with positive attributes. A lot of people just, they'll read it based on what it says literally and it uses positive attributions. So how does the Rambam view that? Well, our basic prayer, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. What, what exactly does that commit us to? Uh, for him, it's more than just saying that there's one God as opposed to 12 or 15. It, it, that's part of it, okay? But he thought, uh, and I would back him up on this, that by saying that God is one, we mean that uh, if we think about God, we have only one notion or one idea before our minds. All right, let, let me try to explain that in a little bit more detail. He thought, uh, let me just, I'm going to back up a little bit and then come back to the Shema. Maimonides makes the following argument. Anything that is composed of parts, I'll try to go slowly. Anything that is, is multiplex, okay, needs a cause for what brings the parts together. I repeat, anything that, that is multiplex or complex requires a cause for what brings the parts together. Your car has many parts, and that's why there had to be an external cause to assemble them, okay? Your house has many parts, so it needs to be an external cause to assemble them. Uh, your body, uh, has multiple parts. And there was, of course, two external causes to bring you into existence. All right. Now, if God had multiple parts, then what would follow? There would have to be a cause external to God that brought God into existence. Now, Maimonides thinks that's absurd. Right? There is no cause external. There's no cause superior to God. Therefore, God has no parts. God is radically one. Shema Yisroel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. You are committing yourself to the view that God is, there's only one notion there. Now, the problem with language is that predicate, when you predicate something of something else, by definition, you have two notions before your mind. All right, if I say John is tall, I have two knives, John and the property that he exemplifies. If I say that Susan uh, is musical, I have two properties to Susan. Okay, we can go on and on and on, but I, I, hope, I hope the point is, is clear. Predicate, when you predicate A of B, you have two things before your mind. And that's fine for anything other than God. Great. Okay, let's go back to God. You can only have one notion before your mind. Now, if that's the case, let's think about what that implies. It would imply, would it not, that we have to be very careful about predicating anything of God, lest we introduce complexity into something that our own tradition tells us is radically one and has to be one. So if you, anything that you say about God, uh, uh, if you, God is good, God is wise, God is powerful, God, you can't have two notions before your mind. Now, if that's the case, then predication of God, predicating attributes of God in the way that we do with everything else is distortion. It makes it seem as if God is like everything else in being complex or multiplex, a subject of multiple properties. God is not a subject of multiple properties. Again, if that were the case, there would have to be something that brought those properties together and God would no longer be ultimate. 
so the point of negative theology is to say, actually, you're a lot closer to the truth when you deny predication of God. All right, so, so what, what do I really know about God? Well, I know that God is not multiplex. I know that God is not material. I know that God does not lack intelligence. I know that, God, okay, so it's going to be one negation. I, I know that God does not lack power. I know that God has no limitations. So all of these are negating predicates of God rather than applying them. So the advantage of negative theology is it doesn't introduce complexity where it doesn't belong. Okay, now uh, uh, I understand that you, ha you have to rethink a fair amount of what we say in order to grasp what's going on here. And I also admit this is fairly abstract. Uh, if, you, if you're having trouble with this notion, and I certainly understand, it's taken me a long time to get to the bottom of it myself, uh, go back, always go back to the Shema. Always go back to, to basics. What is this prayer, which we say multiple times a day, what are you really saying? Don't, don't just mouth the words, okay? Uh, that's not enough. Ask yourself what the consequences of this are and what it really is committing you to. And uh, if you do, uh, he thinks you will begin to see that predication of God in a normal way doesn't work. Now, uh, what follows from that? Uh, if you can't predicate things of God in the normal way, what are we, what are we, what are we getting? What's the insight that, that uh, underlies all of negative theology? Answer, that God is unique. God is unlike anything else. The, uh, the way that we talk about God cannot be like the way that we talk about other things. The way that we think about God cannot be like the way we think about other things. God is not, according to Maimonides, just another big, powerful, intelligent thing in the universe along with others. God stands alone. God is separate from everything else. Uh, if you wanna go uh, uh, back to the Bible, what does the prophet Isaiah say? To whom will you liken me that I should be compared? To whom will you liken me that I should be compared? And there's only one answer. Nothing. What, what is the prophet all, also? All things are as nothing before God. Now this, this places a, uh, a large challenge in front of a person who, who wants to be a monotheist, wants to fulfill the first commandment. How do you deal with something that's completely unique? How do you deal with something that is unlike everything? You can't make any comparison. How do you deal with something such that everything is as nothing before it? Okay, you're going to have to rethink the way you talk about it. You have to rethink the way you formulate things about it. You have to go very, very, be very, very careful. That's a long-winded answer, which I apologize for about negative theology. It doesn't mean you're negative on, about life, okay? And it doesn't mean you're rejecting God. It simply means you're putting God in a category separate from everything else in the universe and saying what's true of everything else cannot necessarily be just shifted over and true of God. That's what the, that's actually the misnomer people have about the word kedusha, which is falsely Sorry. translated. Yeah, it's it's not it's not about holiness, which I, again is more of a Christian concept, but it's actually about separation. Exactly. He's completely, he's completely separate from his creation. I don't know why does that why is that important. Uh, 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 Israel is separate from, according to the Bible, Israel is separate from all the other nations of the world. Shabbat is separate from the other six days of the week. 
Right. Uh, uh, it, 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 Judaism is a religion that requires separation. So uh, as I've said, uh, 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 well, if you want another way of looking about it, what I love is Havdalah. But what do we do? We praise God for making separations or distinctions. Right. Uh, in Jude, there's Milchik and there's Fleshik. I mean, okay. So I would say that if you want to think of it this way, Judaism is a religion of either or. There's God and then there's everything else. So that's, it's either one or the other, but they're separate. If you believe it, I don't want to start a religious war here, but Christianity <laughs> would be a religion of both and. Jesus is both divine and human simultaneously. That's not a move for us. That's not a possibility for us. So even uh, within Judaism, there are strains like mystical strains that would understand God in you know the he is he's in this world. Or, I mean, they try to bridge God back, the infinite God back into. Right. But God is, but he's measured in degrees, right? As as opposed to what the Rambam yeah. is saying, which yeah. he's not even on the spectrum. Right, that's right. Now here, let, let you want to be controversial, really? How about some real controversy, folks? Let's do it. We're down. <laughs> we're, you're in. Yeah, we're totally in. Here's what Maimonides says, and uh, I think our, if we just leave it at this, he and I are going to be accused of heresy. But let's start, <laughs> and then I'll try to explain. Don't, don't put me in harem for this, okay, guys? You have our word. <laughs> All right. Maimonides says the following. It is not true that God is wiser than I am. It is not true that God is more powerful than I am. It is not true that God is better than I am. It is not true that God uh, will last longer than I do. These are all false statements. Now, wait a minute. Why does he say this? Because if you want to argue that God is wiser than I am, you are putting God and me on the same scale of comparison. You're saying that it makes sense to compare us. Okay? Maimonides' point is, no, it doesn't. God is off any scale of intelligence that you and I or anybody else is on. God is a whole other thing, okay? You can say that Einstein is wiser than Seaskin. You can say that Seaskin's wife is wiser than Seaskin, okay? Because you can, that puts us on the same scale. We're, we're humans and you can compare. You can compare IQs, you can compare SAT scores, you compare grade point averages, you can compare anything. Okay, but it wouldn't make any sense to compare God in this way, right? It, it, the same thing with power. You, you can say that uh, somebody is stronger than I am. You can say that a diesel locomotive is stronger than a car or a hurricane is stronger. Okay, you can compare things in the, in the world that are finite and put them on a scale of compare. But you can't, all the power that we talk about in terms of horsepower or wind power or uh, muscle power or anything has no relation to the power of creating the whole universe ex nihilo. Uh, uh, they're, they're completely different. Okay, and so he is uh, suspicious of claims like God is wise, God is powerful, God lasts. It, 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 isn't, it, it isn't that he's saying they're meaningless. What he's saying is just think about what it's committing you to. And if it commits you to putting God on the same scale as a human being, then you've missed the point of monotheism because that can't be true, All right? Zeus was more powerful than anybody, but Zeus's power was comparable to that of Greek heroes. And same thing with it. So what this comes down to, God is not a bigger, stronger, better, 
more lasting version of us. Okay? If that's what you think, you don't have God. You have Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman or uh, that's not God. God is off any scale that you can put anything that's finite on. Once again, I emphasize the utter uniqueness of God going back to the prophet Isaiah. So there's like an apocryphal uh, mystical text that appeared in the late Middle Ages um, called uh, Shir Koma, which anthropomorphizes God you know, it poses as a mystical work, but it actually does even more damage. And the Rambam says, you know, we should burn this book. It's it, whoever, whoever wrote this, it's, it's a travesty, right? So I think it goes along with your point that, you know, people try to paint Maimonides as this Kabbalist or somebody who would believe in these manifestations, um, but actually it's the opposite. It, was, it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't, these two ideas can't really fit together. No, that's right. My friend Menachem Kellner uh, has written a book on Maimonides' uh, uh, objection to mysticism, and his thesis is, which I, I'm pretty much in agreement with, the mystical tradition, much of it, not all of it, much of it was a response to Maimonides. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't Maimonides. It was people who uh, didn't agree with what he was saying. And they're all pseudo pseudepigraphical. So they, right. appear, they all appeared, you know, after the Rambam's time, but they were, you know, that's attributed right. to ancient authors like uh, Shimon Bar Yochai. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Again, I repeat, God is not a bigger, better, stronger version of a human being. That's what you could say about the Greek gods and goddesses. We, we are monotheists. We don't, that's not what he thinks Judaism is committed to. And he has the prophet Isaiah and other prophets backing him up. To go on Benji's point, I think to kind of encapsulate it, it seems like what the Rambam did is he removed God so much from the picture to some extent that there's a certain vacuum that mysticism tried to come and kind of kind of re-grab that. Re -grab. Well, now it, it, it's hard, you see, because what he's saying is you can't form an image of God in your mind. You can't compare God to anything else. God's power, intelligence, uh, uh, life is unlike anything that we can experience. Well, the, the objection to that, uh, it, it's as many people today as, as then, how do I worship a God that I can't yeah. see, can't imagine, can't yeah. uh, predicate anything of? It leaves a void. It leaves a void. And, and, yeah. Right. How do I worship a God who's that transcendent, who's that unique, who's that separate from the rest of the world? And the answer to that is, es uh, ist schwer zu sein a Yid. You know what that means? It's hard to be a Jew. <laughs> Okay, so he thought uh, that when you said the first commandment, every oh well, that's easy to believe in the existence of God. Aha! But the first commandment is belief and knowledge of a monotheistic conception of God. Right. Now we're getting somewhere. Why? Because to believe and know in the existence of this kind of a God. I repeat, is a lifetime project of life. It isn't easy. It, 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 you can't just walk into the synagogue and say, I believe, and slap yourself on the back and say, I've done it. I fulfilled the commandment. It's right. much harder than that. Yeah. And it's actually, a, this is an issue of theocentrism versus anthropocentrism, where the, 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 the Kabbalistic worldview is that man serves God in order for God to serve man. So it kind of gives people a feeling of controlling their destiny where they can manipulate, you know, like the upper spheres or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, and the we Rambam, and, and obviously they, they came in, you know, the, it's obvious why the Kabbalists felt the need to counteract what Maimonides said, because it kind of leaves you feeling hopeless in a way. And people, people were going through a lot of difficult times during, you know, like all the pogroms that they were going through. And people need to feel like they have to take part in, in the creations, not just God. Well, you could argue, you know, it's our job to try to perfect creation. We are partners with God in some sense of the word. Have to be careful with that too. But 
we can't pressure God into doing anything. We can't put any leverage on God. Uh, we can follow God's commandments. That's what I would mean by being a partner. Uh, but any suggestion that we have influence over God in forcing God to do something is, uh, uh, is folly. It's just pure folly. Okay. Again, it's hard. This is a hard pill to swallow, and I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. This isn't easy. If he's right, Judaism isn't easy. If he's right, Judaism puts before you one of the greatest challenges a human being can ever face, and that's to be a true monotheist in his sense of the word. Uh, uh, not all of us make it. Uh, uh, I myself sin against it. I want to make it seem as if I'm perfect. I'm not. I sin against it, and I think most people do from time to time, but let's just be honest about that it is a sin. Once you begin to think of God in human terms, he believes you've committed a sin. Violation of the first commandment. Segue into creation. Um, you mentioned